Acts chapter number two is where we're going to spend our time today. Obviously, uh, there is a very powerful and important liturgical calendar that we take very seriously as part of the global church uh, all throughout the world. In various different countries, in very different places, people are celebrating this very important day and uh, it is tantamount to other high holy days in the life of the church. Uh, Christmas, obviously we celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus. Easter, we celebrate Easter as the resurrection of the Lord. Uh, Pentecost is a, a festival that has its origins in the Jewish tradition, if you will. Uh, the biblical text often records the festivals to be a place and a space for the children of Israel to constantly bring to God a certain kind of offering. It is a practice, if you will. It is a discipline. It is an opportunity for us to take seriously that time that is not bound or regimented with practice can become mundane and lose significance. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like if you never celebrated a birthday? Amen. There may be some of you who uh, stopped celebrating a while ago because you want to forget how old you are. <laughs> but is not that the point? There is the need to put a point in time so you can indeed have a reference that not only has God been faithful, but that you are still here in the midst of all that has been happening. And, and, and it is indeed a gift to know that Pentecost, which stands for 50, 50 days after the Passover, they found themselves in a place in a space waiting for, as the scriptures said, to be endued with power from on high. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm looking for some power, some more power. Amen. From the Lord on today. Acts chapter 2 then is where we'll spend our time. We'll likely spend the next couple weeks preaching a little bit on Pentecost and what it means for our lives and how we are to lay hold to this great gift and this great power. But it is worth starting in this particular passage in the name of the Lord. Oh, they didn't get it. Acts chapter number two, uh, we'll spend our time here. And the scripture says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came Sorry about that. The team telling me I didn't send on the slides and I didn't hit send. Amen. So y'all should have them now. All right, Acts chapter number two. When the day of Pentecost had come, they all were together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, verse number five, now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, so again, there's a sound that's going on. And at the sound that they heard, isn't it interesting that when a heavenly sound, when a divine sound happens, you can be minding your own business. But when God moves, everybody takes notice. Anybody ever had a circumstance in your life where you weren't looking for God, but God was looking for you? 
I can't talk to nobody on Pentecost Sunday. Hey Amen. You, 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 you may have been running from God, and God just kind of gave you a sound, and you kind of like, oh, that, that's a different. That's that's different. Well, the devout Jews from every nation under heaven were in Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, why were they in Jerusalem? Because Pentecost, the festival, required every Jew who was within travel distance to bring their offerings to the temple. So you've, you had this moment, this synchronistic moment, if you will, this moment where God aligned God's power being poured out with the most diverse group of Jewish people landing in the same place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit falling on the day of Pentecost was something that was a strategic deployment of God's gifts to a people who were on the lookout for God's encounter. So at the sound of the crowd, at this sound, the crowd gathered and they were be bewildered. Why were they bewildered? Because each one of these diverse Jews who were from different parts of the region heard these disciples speaking in native languages of each. Amazed and astonished, the Jews asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Verse number eight, it says, and how is it that we, all of us from different parts of the region who speak different languages, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. I mean, a little bit of everybody was there on that day. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. And they all said they're hearing... This sound from heaven, this good news in a language they could understand it. All of them were amazed, verse 13, and they were perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered at them and said they are filled with new wine. Words of Jamie Foxx blaming on the I, 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 I. <laughs> But Peter said, said, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine in the morning. <laughs> That's... Has some defense, praise God. It's too early for all that. We just woke up from last night. Amen. We, we still recovering. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my servants, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Then everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone. who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Gonna use that as the topic for the next few moments. Pentecost power moves. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and 
May the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Power moves. What if I told you that there was power you had access to that you had not yet used? What if I offered to you today that there's a gift that is within your reach that all you have to do is literally grab a hold to it, open it up, and enjoy it? It is tantamount to you and I appreciating that there is always more for those who follow the ways of God. That contentment need not take the drive from your spirit from accessing more of God. Because whatever you are called to do, beloved, you will need more. If it is the case that you have everything you need now, where is there room for growth? I mean, is it not true, beloved, that uh, every new level you aspire to has another grace that is needed? Every new era you cross into while you are thrust into this era with all that has brought you to this point, there is always a little bit extra that you need to be successful, to be effective, dare I say, to win. I mean, I hope that you see the totality of your life as cumulative, that Whatever you learned yesterday is a building block for what you need to know tomorrow. That there are no shortcuts to getting past a threshold. I recall when I was uh, working out rather frequently uh, leading up to the Super Bowl. You know, Super Bowl really set me back, praise God. I was, I, I, I was, I was, in the gym, you know, because I was trying to fit into my like old Jerry Rice jersey so I could wear it to the Super Bowl. And and I lost like 20, 30 pounds. I was feeling good about myself. And I wore my my jersey to the Super Bowl. Amen. And 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 then they lost. And I just I gave up. I just start comfort eating again. And now I gotta wait till the next season to get back into my Jerry Rice jersey. But when I was in the gym, praise God, uh, my trainer was constantly telling me that you gotta just keep putting good days on top of each other. Cause you know, when I came in the gym, I just wanted to pick up where I left off. You know, I wanted to just do a hundred sit-ups and a hundred push-ups and throw up 350 pounds, you know, on the, on the, on the bench, you know. <laughs> All right. Maybe, maybe 150 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized that I had to add day after day to the work that I did the day before. My pursuit of my goal required consistent application of a certain set of practices. And although I would love to just go back to the day where I could fit in my jersey overnight, I do realize that the more progress I want, the more I must be committed to a pursuit of that goal. Quiet as it's kept, beloved, all of us have goals. All of us have pursuits. All of us spend some days, some weeks, some months pursuing that which God has placed in our heart 
that ambition. And I'm curious to ask you today, what is your God ambition? Do you have a God ambition? Do you have something that is uniquely about my pursuit of more of God? And it's important to appreciate that the disciples in the immediate aftermath of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection could have rested on, well, you know, I'm one of the 12 who walk with Jesus. Now, you got to know that's quite a thing to put on your resume. You know, it's like, uh, you know, me and Jesus, we was boys. This was my partner. All y'all, y'all just ate the bread and the fishes and the loaves. But guess what? I helped make it. When Jesus, I, 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 I cut some of them fishes and loaves. I, 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 I handed it out. I, I was Jesus ride or die. Y'all was just, you know, the people benefiting of Jesus. But me, Jesus knew me by name. Hello, somebody. I mean, they could have just been very content to have been closely affiliated with Jesus. But there was more that they realized they needed because Jesus told them greater works will you do. And if there's greater things that you are called to do, you're going to need more than just the proximity. More than just the name drop. Yeah, me, Jesus, boys. No, Jesus wants you not to be name dropping Jesus name. Jesus wants you to be dropping some power. Power, wherever you go, drop in power in Jesus' name. Power that moves mountains. Power that moves circumstances. Power that moves you from where you are today to where you know God needs you to be. Anybody can be real and say, I'm not where I know God needs me to be. I'm not, I'm not feeling judgmental about it. I just know that God wants more of me. You ought to give yourself a little pat chest and say, God wants more of me. Amen. You just encourage your neighbor and tell him God wants more of you. Amen. God, God wants more of you than what you have given him today. And guess what? God says that there's something that I want to put on your radar. And my question is, can you perceive it? What I love about movements is that they are never made in a vacuum. Movements always emerge out of a context. The Black Power Movement emerged out of a context of oppression, repression, degradation and, and violence and discrimination and exclusion and murder and terror inflicted upon the bodies of and the lives and the families of melanated people, dark-skinned African folk, folk from the diaspora living in an anti-black white supremacist society. And I want you to know, beloved, somebody's trying to bring that back. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I love the Pentecostal movements of the 20th century, 1906, Azusa Street. Many of us who are uh, raised in a Pentecostal church have our origins in the 20th century Azusa Street revival. That context that gave rise to what anthropologists call the fastest growing social movement in the world, along with hip hop and Islam three. Movements that come out of an experience of the anthropologist would describe the poor, the disenfranchised, the disheartened, and the excluded. And in these conditions, beloved, I seem to wonder if God loves to get our attention when we know there's a great need. Because for some of us, we can easily find ourselves being amused to death. We can 
laugh and dance and party while we're on the death march. We can celebrate and distract ourselves and self-medicate ourselves while we are unaware that there is indeed a plan of the enemy intended to knock you and I off our course. And in this context, beloved, you and I are always being invited to have an antenna up for God. In the midst of my trial, God, what are you saying? In the midst of my struggle, God, what are you doing? In the midst of my pain, God, is there more power and healing and spirit that I must access? I mean, think about this. What good is it to have power and not use it? What good is it to have access to a gift and not open it? What good is it to be able to have a certain skill and when the skill is needed to keep the skill hidden and unused? Could it be that you are a superhero with a special power that you just have yet to discover. And on a day like today, I hear the Holy Ghost saying, I'm ready to help you lose your anonymity and tap into a power that you must have in order to make some moves that will change the course of the lives that you love the most. Make no mistake about it, the power of the living God is not something that is just about you becoming a spiritually spooky deep person that has powers when you come to church on Sunday. No, no, we don't need more deep and spooky people. We got enough of those. You got those in the church and out the church, amen. People that are just so deep that they shallow. But I love Bishop Lawson. He's one of the Pentecostal founders of a denomination, the denomination that produced me and my family's Pentecostal legacy. And this is what he says. Uh, he wrote a book in 1930, something called The Anthropology of Jesus, Our Kinsman. And the backdrop, the context of Bishop Lawson was attempting to critique the racism that had consumed the Pentecostal movement 30 years after its inception. And Bishop Lawson said it like this, Pentecostal people could teach this to mainline churches a wonderful lesson by example in showing that the true people of God are one, regardless of what nationality or race they may belong. By abiding together in the bonds of fellowship, love, and organization. We, the Pentecostals, trusted that the Pentecostal people would rise to redeem man by example, by example and precept. It is all right to sing and shout and pray and preach loud. But what this poor world is longing for is the real love of God. Live. Somebody say lived. There's something about what it means to experience Pentecost in a world that is characterized by divisiveness and by fragmentation and by isolation and say to ourselves, God, how would you ask me to live in light of the context I am in? And while I want the power to shout and while I want the power to, to, to preach and while I want the power to pray, God, I also want the power to tear down some barriers. I want the power to defeat the devil I can't see just as much as I need to defeat the devil I can see. I need the power, God, to be able to unlock what is necessary given where I am. And this is the power of Pentecost, beloved. The power of Pentecost is this idea that the first thing Pentecost offers you and I is power to change. Somebody holler, I need to change. I love verse four. It says, all of them, everybody say all of them, 
were filled with the Holy Spirit, which just means that the power of the Spirit fell on everybody. And everybody had the same capacity to have a benefit to this power to change. Now, when you think about changing yourself, how many of you know that can be a Herculean endeavor? Because quiet as it's kept, even when we're not pleased with where we are, we kind of feel like, well, you know, oh, change is hard. And I don't know if I have it within me to change. Anybody ever wanted to change something about yourself, but you found it very difficult to do so? Thank you for those three honest people. Amen. <laughs> Power to change oneself is a critical and necessary endeavor. If you're going to move from where you are today to where you must be, because there is often a history of Pain, trauma, habits, that although you have made it to this point, you realize, man, if I'm going to take the next step, I got to work on this part of me. What I love about the Holy Spirit, what I love about the narrative that often has accompanied the Pentecost experience through history is that the spirit has the ability to grab a hold to you and I and change us radically. Change you from a, 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 a mean, fire-spitting human being to someone who has the capacity to love. Someone who uh, hates the poor to now someone who actually is trying to serve the disenfranchised. Someone who has a predilection to violence and now you are a peacemaker. Someone who was racist and now you embrace everybody. There is a power that changes you from the inside out. And God forbid that you become someone who says, I have received the spirit of God, and yet I still hate people who are different than me. No, there is a power that is required to change you. And the reason why Pentecost is always accompanied with fire is because the fire is one of the few things that has the ability to transform you and fuel you at the same time. Lord, help me to preach in here today. How many know that when, 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 when fire gets a hold to you, you ain't going to stay the same now. That there's something about fire that, that, that burns away some certain things that aren't core Whew. to that thing which it has grabbed a hold to. And at the same time, there's something about fire that can be burning on the inside and keep you going. Fire has the power to transform you and fuel you at the same time. I love the theological traditions of, of the various Pentecostal movements because there's all kinds of ways that the, the, the Pentecostals in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century were trying to give language to this. One such way is the Wesleyans. Y'all ever heard of John and Charles Wesley? They gave birth to the Wesleyan revival movement, which gave birth to the Methodist tradition, which gave birth to the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You might heard the AME Church or the United Methodist Church. You might heard the United Methodist Church or the Christian Methodist Church. And all these different Methodists come from the Wesleys because they created a method. Methodist was from Don and Charles Wesley's methods of how to engage in spiritual renewal. And one of the ways in which the Wesleys taught uh, about the work of the power of the spirit is they said that there is a second work of grace. Lord, I'm about to preach a second work of grace in a second. Uh, uh -huh. the, the first work of grace is when you get uh, touched by the power of the spirit of God that invites you to say yes to God. It is that thing that draws you to God. I know some of us feel like I came to God because, you know, I just was, you know, I just had a consciousness. I had a God consciousness. You know, me and God, we've been talking for a long time. And, and then God just, you know, popped up in my head and I popped up in God's head. No, there is a theological assumption we have in our tradition that no one comes to God unless God draws them. Whew. Hmm. Can you think back to the time where God first drew you in? Amen. You was on the outside and God said, come on in. 
You were discarded and God said, come on in. You were isolated and God said, come on in. Well, that's the first work of grace. But the Wesley said, hey, guess what? That's not the only work that God wants to do in your life. Yes, salvation is yours. And, and yes, you've been justified. But guess what? I want you to also be sanctified. I want to make you pure. I want to make you right. I want to change you. And the second work of grace in the Wesleyan theological framework is this sense that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and it will create a radical change. Lord, have mercy. It will change you from who you were to now who you must be. And I'm here to tell you on a day like today when we're celebrating the day of Pentecost, when Jesus told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait till you get endued with power from on high. Jesus realized, I know you've been hanging out with me, but guess what? You need a second work of grace. If you're going to be my witnesses, you need a little bit more power. If you're going to be my ambassadors, you need a little bit more anointing. If you're going to be my representatives in the earth, you need a little bit more than what you got today. Why? Because I'm about to put you in front of kings. Uh, I'm about to put you in front of emperors. Uh, I'm about to put you in front of soldiers. Uh, I'm about to put you in front of oppressors. Uh, I'm about to put you in front of skeptics. Uh, and I need you to have more power. Lord, help me today. Than what you have right now. Uh, do I have a witness that can say, I need more power? Uh, because the devils I'm facing today, I can't operate uh, off of the little bit of juice I had yesterday. Uh, I need the power to cast the devil out of my house. I need some power to cast the devil out the White House, uh, to cast the devil off my job, uh, to cast the devil out of the Capitol, uh, to cast the devil out of the CEO's office. Uh, I need more power. <laughs> and when you get that power, it will change you, beloved. It'll change you into a whole different person. It'll make you walk into places knowing that you got all of heaven behind you. You telling me no? I was like, mm, I don't care what you're talking about. Because I got power. I got power to change this little old shy, introverted, unsure human being to someone who is able to look at evil in the face and say no more. This bruised human being who's been the fodder for someone else's wickedness. I have the power now to seek out healing and realize that I need not be trapped in the prison someone put me in. Because of their wicked dysfunction. Because of their abuse. Because of their mendacity. So, 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 beloved, how is the Holy Spirit changing you from who you are today? To who you must become. How are you allowing the spirit through the practices of the second work of grace? How? 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 Well, there are spiritual practices. Just like I, I had to go to the gym and, and, and do the sit-ups. Guess what? There is a spiritual version of a sit-up. There is a spiritual version of a push-up. There is a spiritual discipline practice of a bench press and, 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 and of a squat. And some of us are trying to be changed without going through the practices. In the text it says they were all gathered together. Guess what? There's a spiritual practice of gathering. They were all on one accord. There's a spiritual practice of unity. They were all praying. There's a spiritual practice of prayer. They were all worshiping. There's a spiritual practice of worship. Not for prayer's sake, not for worship's sake, not for gathering's sake, but for the sake of power. And when I get power, I'm not going to use my power on you. Some of us got it twisted. I think I'm supposed to use my power when you have to discern. It's a waste of power. When you got all these devils out here, devils in the systems, devils in the schools, devils in the streets, devils in the politics, and you in here practicing on one another. 
Now, believe me, there's some folk who need a good, you know, touch from the Lord. We're going we gonna, to we gonna give you that touch. But I dare not practice on the people of God more than I would practice on the wickedness in high places. God gives you power to change the world just as much as God gives you power. To change yourself. Second thing that the scriptures say for those who are interested in the impact of Pentecost to have these power moves is God gives you power to speak boldly. Tell me how to speak boldly. It, it is it is worth saying that in verse number eleven that they all heard in their own languages the deeds of power that God had done. And I want you to appreciate that there's something miraculous about being able to speak boldly what God is doing in a language that people can understand. How many of you know that part of God's second work of grace in your life is to help you become a translator of God's deeds of power? To the people you are around. Could it be beloved that we have. Misplaced. The emphasis. On the preacher. To be the sole. Bearer of good news. I mean we must do our part because the scripture says how can they hear unless. A preacher is sent. We, 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 we have our role. But on the day of Pentecost, beloved, I want you to realize that it was 120 folks speaking in different languages. So all these visitors in the city of Jerusalem at the same time could hear the same message. Think of the diversity of your family, your neighborhood your profession, your vocation. And think of how your voice is uniquely situated as a possibility to translate the good deeds of God so they can hear it. A lot of folk ain't gonna come here, Pastor Mike preach. A lot of folk ain't gonna hear a minister preach, but guess what? You hanging out with them speaking the good news in a way that they can understand it is an act of Pentecostal power movement that when you know for yourself what God is up to against the backdrop of what the world is doing because I got news for you beloved the, 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 the one who is able to speak boldly in a language someone can understand it will always sound like this it will be good news to the oppressed and bad news to the oppressor I want you to know beloved that when you are speaking good news to the oppressed the oppressed will find a way to find uh, agency and power and redemption and when you're speaking bad news to the oppressor they're going to always try to silence your voice with violence and with exclusion and with punishment uh, that's why I love the protests that are happening on the college campuses uh, because I hear some, some, some Pentecostal power movement coming up uh, through the voices of students and righteous people calling for an end to the genocide uh, that is in Palestine uh, and you know the worst thing about the powerful is that when they hear the bad news uh, that is to be good news uh, rather than repenting they actually use more violence uh, as a way to even condemn themselves further that they are out of step with the ways of God uh, but that's why you gotta keep crying aloud uh, that's why you gotta keep speaking uh, that's why you got to keep protesting and keep hollering out for justice and healing until it happens on your watch. And I want you to know, beloved, that 
the, 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 the act of protesting, the act of speaking power and good news to the oppressed may not change the circumstance immediately. But it does give you the opportunity to say, I will not comply. I will not be complicit. I will be a tongue talker. I will be somebody who will speak with new tongues. Uh, I will be somebody who will allow the spirit of God to give me an intimate relationship that allows a connection that says I can speak good news in a way others can hear it. Uh, uh, there is a powerful, powerful opportunity for you and I to lean into a new kind of language. And a new kind of speech, uh, a speech that says, I will speak boldly to the forces of oppression. I will speak boldly to the forces of depression. I will speak boldly to the forces of isolation. And I will not become an agent of that which the enemy is trying to spread abroad. No, I will be an agent of the most high God. Uh, and this is why I want to invite you people of the way, uh, people of God, to say, God, what? What must I say differently? What must I be open to today? That will give me the gift of a new language, a new tongue, a new way of speaking. I know I got some four letter words that can change the environment immediately. But is there another way of speaking that God is saying, I want to unleash through your mouth? Is there another way of you being able to show up and speak with power in a way that people who you don't know uh, will be able to hear the good news of God uh, and say I must be saved uh, I must be delivered uh, I must be set free uh, and this is the power uh, that I want you to know is accessible today uh, what good is it to have access to power and you and I not use it uh, I want you to know that there's a power uh, that God wants to give you today uh, in verse 17 it says that you will prophesy uh, I want you to know that there is a word from the Lord uh, that only you can speak uh, uh, there is a vision uh, that you will have uh, God can give you new eyes uh, so you can look at a circumstance uh, and they may see death uh, but in the midst of your circumstance uh, you can see life uh, they may see despair uh, but in the midst of your circumstance uh, they can find hope uh, I want you to know that there is a gift uh, for you to dream a new dream uh, a dream that is able uh, to save you and your family uh, to save you and your village uh, to save you and your city uh, to save you and this country uh, to save you and this world uh, and God is saying I I want to give you visions. Uh, I want to give you dreams. Uh, and guess what? I want to help save everybody. Uh, somebody say everybody. Say it again, everybody. Uh, that includes the Palestinians. Somebody say everybody. That includes the Sudanese. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes the Congolese. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes the Israeli. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes black folks. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes white folks. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes Asian. Somebody say everybody. Uh, that includes Latino. Somebody say everybody. Uh, everybody uh, who calls on the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. And this everybody requires our collective ability to stand in the gap. Stand with me everybody. We, we about to pray. We about to invite the power of the spirit to be at work among us, but everybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody. everybody. Not just the people you like. Not just the people you agree with. Not just the people who share your political, ideological, but everybody. This is the call of we as Pentecostal people, 
God, help us to be a part of the vision for everybody. And when you speak boldly, the words that God places in your mouth, as the Spirit gives you ability, it changes you. The scripture says that on the day when they were together, they were all on one accord. With one mouth, one mind, one vision, one focus. And they were waiting for power to come to them from on high. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now and let's just take a moment and invite the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Let us invite a power and a spirit to have full access to our being, our mouth, our mind, our hands, our feet. God, I want I want to be radically turned from whatever and whoever I seem to be today to a agent of Pentecostal power. I want to be able, God, to live in a way that brings healing. I want to be able to move in a way that brings wholeness. I want to be able, God, to change and transform systems. Above all that, God, I want to be someone in direct connection with you. So I lift my hands to you today and I invite you, God, to change me. Change my heart. Change my mind. Change my spirit. Change me, God, so I can be an agent of healing and justice in the world. So it says, a wonderful Come on, keep those hands lifted to the Lord. And let's invite the Lord to change us. The first change I need is within me. A wonderful has come over me. Grab the hand of a person real quick. God, I am touching someone today that has been assigned to me as a witness on this day of Pentecostal power movement. I pray, God, that you will first start a change within them that is undeniable. God, whatever is happening inside of them that is seeking to silence them, that is seeking to steal their joy that is seeking to lock them in a past prison of shame and despair and trauma god i pray today that the windows the doors the jail cells will bust open and god they will experience pentecostal power today a movement god that is like the sound of a rushing mighty wind movement today god that begins to feel their body from the sole of their feet to the crown of their head. Make it undeniable, God, the one I'm touching. May they feel free. Free from the bondage of the enemy. Free from the hardship of the season. Free Lord God, to tap into the powers that you placed within them to be an agent of your new kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and God I pray for a change that will happen immediately and most powerfully may it happen in me if you're here today